Yeah. Right, so we will continue in Tehillim, chapter 30. As you know, Tehillim is divided either chapters per month, in other words, that you can read it and complete the whole Tehillim in one month, in other words, uh, a certain amount of chapters every day, and you can complete it in a month, or you can complete it in a week. So the Tehillim is also divided in seven. It's divided in 30, and divided in seven. There was 30 that you have a certain amount of chapters that will allow you to complete it in one month, and seven that it will allow you to complete it in one week. Chapter 30 begins the second day. In other words, if you, if you have it in seven days, the first portion uh, up to chapter 29 is the first day, and then beginning with chapter 30, it goes on to uh, the second day. It's a small chapter. It's a chapter that is said in the prayer. Important uh, chapter. Mizbor Shir Hanukkah by the David. David Amelech is talking about the inauguration Hashem, of the temple of the Beit HaMikdash. So he begins with the words Mizmor, that this is a psalm, that this is a, a composition that he put together, but then he adds the word Shir again. Shir is a song. So they ask, why does he have to say Mizmor and Shir? So some say that he's referring to the first temple and to the second temple. Others say that he's referring to the temple that is in Shemaim, that is in heaven. That corresponds to the, to the temple that, here's, that is here below. So one is referring to that, one is referring to here. Either way, he's talking about the Bet HaMikdash, and that is why he calls it Habayit, the David. He's talking about the inauguration of Abayda David. Now, what, what does David have to do with the Bet HaMikdash? Shlomo Melech built the first Bet HaMikdash. Ezra HaSofer was involved in the building of the second Bet HaMikdash. But the Hanukkah Abayit, really the inauguration is from, from when you set the stone, from when, you, from when you lay the stone, the first stone, the blueprints, the planning. So David HaMelech is involved from the very beginning with this idea, with buying the place, with setting up the place, with figuring out where it's going to be, even though the, the actual job will be given over to his son. For a variety of reasons, David Melech doesn't get involved in the actual building. It doesn't happen during his lifetime. Shalomo Melech takes over. Still, being that Shalomo is his son, he gets a lot of credit for it too. You know, as the rabbis tell us, the son is a continuation of the father. A son does good things in this world during his lifetime. The father gets some credit for it too. This is his son. This is his continuation. If a son misbehaves, then it also pains and embarrasses the father. So there's no doubt that there's a connection even between the neshamot of the father and the son. And it's very meaningful here that Shalomo, the son of David, is the one that's actually going to be building this home. But the Hanukkah Bayit, David the Melech, is already initiating the inauguration of, the, of this home. And he puts together a song to celebrate the fact that he merited having uh, a part of this, and he merited having his son complete the job. Aromimcha Adonai Kedilitani. The word Aromimcha means I will elevate you. There's a lot of words that David Amelech could have used to elevate Hashem. And there's a lot of words that describe the greatness of Hashem, that we praise Him that we thank him, that we exalt him, extol him, right? There's a lot of different kinds of words that are used in Tehillim, all over Tehillim, to describe the greatness of Hashem. Here, Aromim Cha means a little bit different. It also means that I elevate him, I raise him above everything else. I give him more importance than everything else. And I am a farsemet. I will publicize it as well. So, Aromim Cha, Hashem, I will raise you or elevate you above everything else. And why will I do that? Even though there's a lot of reasons to do so. But here, there's an interesting connection between the next word, Kidilitani. I will raise you because you've raised me. Dilitani is also a very interesting word. Here's a second, a second verb that is being used to describe a similar function, to raise. What's the difference? So we said, romem is talking about heights. 
it's talking about publicizing, about making something very, very known to people, making it more important than anything else. Dilitani comes from the word Dili. Dili is a bucket that you use in a well, right, to draw water. Where's the water? Below, underneath, very, very low, in the well, in the pit. So the, you, we're using here the word dilitani, that was to raise the bucket. To raise the bucket, where does the bucket come from? From a very, very low spot. So the Vila Mena says he was very, very low. He was very, very down. So here he uses that word to describe how low he was and how Hashem is the one that took him from where he was so low and raised him back up and made him king. So he says, I will elevate you the way the human being can elevate God, through prayer, through song, through praising Him, through mention, talking about the miracles, making Him known. And this will be as a result of the fact that I've come out from where I was. And you didn't make my enemies happy. In other words, they didn't rejoice over my downfall. They didn't rejoice over my failures. On the contrary, they were able to see how you took me out from where I was. And of course, they were upset. An enemy is not happy when you, when, when, when the enemy, when his enemy gets out of trouble. But Hashem did not allow them to be happy and to rejoice in the downfall of David Chaz Shalom. So he has what to thank of Hashem for taking him out of that situation and not giving them any reason to be so happy. It's not, this is not a personal thing. And as we've said many, many times, David HaMelech is concerned about the Chilul Hashem, the desecration of Hashem's name that may happen, God forbid, if the wicked, the evildoers, get their way and think that they're right for what they did, that the other person who's really righteous is wrong, he's suffering. So this is a Kiddush Hashem, that they were able to see, wow, he was able to come out of that, he was able to survive, despite all the suffering, despite all the pain, despite all the enemies he had. So it's a, it, it elevates Hashem too. It's a sanctification of Hashem's name. And David personally is happy too. Adonai Elohai, shivati elecha batir pa'ini. David Amelef reminds us that part of what, of, of how he succeeded, of how he was able to come out of where he was, was because he cried to Hashem, he prayed to Hashem. And what kind of prayer? It was shivati elecha. I cried out to you. That's another word that has various synonyms in Hebrew. Se'aka, right? This is another word to call out, to raise one's voice and call out to Hashem. However, shivati, the commentary say, is used in connection with prayer. It's not just crying. It's not just crying out loud. It's, uh, it's a prayer that is being said out loud. So he cried out loud in prayer, not just to cry. You know, a lot of people just cry and cry and cry. But they don't say anything, right? That's useless. It's, it's, at least it's not as powerful as a shivati elecha. Shivati elecha means that you cry out, but you're saying words of prayer to Hashem. And as a result of shivati elecha vatir pa'eni, you, you healed me. Healed me of what? Was he sick? Not necessarily, he's not talking about necessarily any illness in particular. He's talking about his emotional state of being. People who are depressed, people who are down, people who feel terrible, disappointed, aggravations. Refaini over here is healing of the soul. And this is important because if the soul is not healed, then the physical body suffers as well. So a person feels better, his soul is is healed. In other words, he's emotional, emotionally stable. He's happy. He's content with his situation. He's optimistic. That helps one's physical health as well. If a person is depressed, sad, heartbroken, disappointed, it could really make things worse for him on a physical level too. So, but by any means over here that you have healed me from all those feelings that he had, from all the sorrow that he had. 
אדוני העלית מן שאול נפשי חייתני מיד ויבור. Here David המלך describes how you've taken me out more than once. מן שאול, from the grave. You've taken me out, you've raised me from the grave, my nafshi, my soul. חייתני, you've kept me alive. מיד ויבור, not being with those who go down to the grave. Here, he's emphasizing, as he's done before, how close he was to dying, how he was so many times involved in danger. And Hashem, at the last moment, took him out. Elita means Sheol, that means he was already in Sheol, he was already close to dying. He was in great danger, and Hashem took him out almost at the last moment. The second part, one can translate me, Yardivor, is also that Hashem saved him or protected him from Chazashom not being involved or following the ways of the wicked. As we've explained before, Yardibor is also a description of those that, that do not accomplish anything in their life. They're considered dead, as the rabbis tell us, that Sadiqim, the righteous, are even alive when they're dead. In other words, their accomplishments are still around. Whereas those who are evil, even while they're alive, they're physically alive, but they're considered dead because they don't contribute anything. So they're called Yardi Bor, those that end up going to the Bor. In other words, they don't accomplish anything. They end up going to the pit. So Hashem has saved him physically from danger and has saved him from associating or from being considered a Chazjom e Rasha. Now, what's interesting about this is that it's not only the number of times that this happens to him, but it, many times it happened almost at the last minute. And this has happened to a lot of people where they, would, they thought that they were going to die, the danger was imminent, they thought that there was no chance for escape, and at the last minute something happened. Either the gun jammed, or they, they were released by the king, or somehow they were able to escape. There are many, many stories. So it could be that a person was even sick for a long time, and all of a sudden, he begins to recover. And little by little, he comes out of it. And there is there is an incident right now in Israel too, in one of the hospitals with the soldier, who was very very seriously injured. And Baruch Hashem, little by little, he's coming out of it and he's recovering. Very very serious. The, the doctors didn't know what to say. They didn't really uh, think he was going to come out of it. He opened up his eyes yesterday, and I believe now he's walking talking. So sometimes you see miraculous recoveries from death, in other words, from the edge of death. So David Melech has experienced that too. Now when this happens, that could be that all along Hashem wanted it to be this way, that the person would come close to death and then come out of it. Or it could be that at the last moment he came out of it. In other words, let's say the person was was uh, going to die. It was a decree, terrible decree. And at the last moment, either through prayer, Tehillim, or whatever, Hashem canceled the decree. So you could have either that, where the decree was canceled as a result of some deed, some prayer. And the prayer does not necessarily mean that it was the prayer of the, of the sick man himself. It could have been many, many people praying for him. Or it could be that all along, Hashem wanted it to be just till the last minute, one moment before, I'll let you go. And it was just to, to show him that Hashem is in charge. And even though he was almost, almost ready to give up, Hashem taught him, never give up, even at the last minute. As I told you a story in Auschwitz, where the, a whole group of young men were in a gas chamber. So when you're in a gas chamber, and you know that this is a gas chamber, you say Shema Yisrael, you confess, and then all you, all they needed, all that needed to happen was to press the button for the, to release the gas. And at the end, the door was open. One of the generals needed a whole bunch of workers, <laughs> young workers in some other camp, so they were released. According to another version, what happened was that the, they were liberated. In other words, by the time they got ready, you know, they were already in the room. The Americans were approaching. The siren. What is that? Siren. 
Was yeah, there was a siren or something, yeah. So people were under the guillotine, people were about to be hanged. Last minute, something happened. So it could either be that Hashem had it planned like that, that it should be like that till the last moment, or it could be that it was a decree, and they were going to die, and it was canceled as a result of some prayer. You have similar situations with Mavet Klini, clinical death, near-death experience, where people have really died. People have died, and they have come back. And when they come back, they share, of course, their experience, that they were in heaven, that they saw their parents, their grandparents, they saw people who have already passed away. They, they really had a real experience. It wasn't just a dream. And they were told that their time has not come yet. Or they were told, you know, if you take upon yourself something, then you'll, you'll go back. In other words, they, they understood that that would save their life if they committed themselves to do something. Many, many stories amongst the Jews and amongst the non-Jews. Uh, millions of individuals who have gone through near-death experiences who have similar experiences. And sometimes it was as a result of something that they did that because of that, they were able to come back. And one story that I like to tell is with my uncle who underwent through his life various uh, heart, uh, open heart surgeries. The first one was a very, very difficult one uh, when he was younger. As they were operating on him, it was a bypass, and they were finishing up, the heart didn't start. So they're done. The heart's supposed to start, because you know they, they disconnect the heart, the, the machine is, is pumping the blood. They were trying to reconnect the heart, the heart wasn't working. And it was a big, big tzaddik then in uh, California. He was in Los Angeles for a number of years. His name was the Rebbe of Rimnitz, which my father contacted. And uh, the rabbi, who was a great tzaddik, very pious man, uh, prayed together with a group of people and basically said as follows, it's going to be tough, but it's going to come out of it. And uh, they prayed for him. And at the end, it was a very, very long operation. And he came out of it, Baruch Hashem. And I remember that when he came home, he told what he experienced. During that time that the heart was not working, he saw himself in the heavenly court. And they were angels. He could hear that they were angels on the right and on the left. Some were saying, well, let him go. You know, he was a good man. He did what he did. There's no reason for him to stay. You know? And others were saying, no, 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 no. He did a tremendous mitzvah, tremendous good deed when he was a young man uh, in yeshiva. A, a family that had come from South America who did not know the language here in this country. And he helped them find a home. He helped them find a job. He put the man on his feet, as they say. And as a result of that, the man was able to uh, get along, you know, and have, uh, have a decent life, all because of my uncle. So that mitzvah stood out very, very much. He, he recalls hearing that mitzvah being related in heaven, how he did so much for this family. And that like tipped the scale. And as soon as that, was, you know, was that story was told, his eyes woke up, the heart started working. You know, was, that, was, that is what, what did it. One mitzvah could make a difference. It could be one deed that we perhaps even forgot about it. It was done a long time ago that made the whole difference. So that is what David Melech is saying here. It was, you, you kept me alive, even though he was close to danger, and he could have died, Hashem kept him alive. The next pasuk, So David Melech says, all those, who have experienced what he has experienced. Miracles. Should sing to Hashem, should praise to Hashem. And he calls them chasidav. Why does he call them chasidav? Now chasidav means the pious. Usually it means people who are pious, people who understand that things don't happen by themselves, that they happen from Hashem. So they should be the ones that they should be singing and thanking Hashem. 
That's the literal meaning. But I was thinking perhaps David Melech is putting an emphasis and using this word of Chassidav because he's telling us whoever experienced a miracle experienced the chesed of Hashem, the kindness of Hashem. So Zamerul Hashem, who should sing to Hashem, who should praise Hashem? Chassidav, those who have experienced a chesed, an act of kindness from Hashem. And give, give thanks to Him, to His name, to His holy name. This is something that has to be done at all times. In other words, if somebody experienced a miracle, experienced an act of chesed, he should tell people about it to reinforce, to strengthen their faith and their emunah. Right? And this is something that he owes to Hashem too. That is the whole idea of the, and the whole purpose of the blessing that we say, HaGomel LeChaseh, LeChayavim Tov, Rosh Hashim So he says, he, along with anyone else who has experienced the chesed of Hashem, give thanks to Hashem and praise Him and publicize the miracles that you experienced. Now he goes back to the difficult times. He says, even though a person may find himself in a difficult situation, kirega, he says, kirega be'apo chayim birtsono. It's very important that one place the, the commas and the, and the, in other words, the punctuation should be right because otherwise it's confusing. Sometimes the pasuk is not so clear and the words seem, don't seem to fit. So it's important to know where to break it up. Kirega, be'apo. When Hashem is upset, when Hashem's anger flares up, it could only last for a rega. Even a rega is too much. A rega means a moment. But it could be that it's just a moment. And therefore, don't give up. Things can change. Chaim birtsono. You can get life. You can acquire life. Respite, in this case. Birtsono. If you appease him. If one does the shuvah, one repents. One asks Hashem for forgiveness. No, it was to appease. To make Hashem... Uh, appeased. That can happen, of course, and then, of course, the kas, the af, is gone. It's gone so much so that ba'erev yalin bechi, you went to sleep at night with bechi crying, and velabo kerina, and you woke up rejoicing. Imagine, I mean, you've heard stories of people who couldn't walk, they were paralyzed, and all of a sudden they started walking. It was overnight, next day. Just before, he was in a, in a very difficult state. And right after that, somehow, either the tumor disappeared, the pain went away. So, kirega be'apo, even if Hashem is upset, even if there's anger, apo means the, the anger, the, the attribute of justice is very, very much prosecuting him, accusing him, that could last only for rega. After that, chayim birtsono, we can get our life back if we appease Hashem. So it could be that at the night, the day before, we cried, we prayed to Hashem, and the following day they will be, they will be rejoicing. This is something that David Melech says that everyone has to believe. It's not just that something that he experienced, it's not only something that he has seen happen, this is something they said that we have to believe because everybody goes through hard times, ups and downs, challenges in life. And we are supposed to believe that there's not a shame, it should only be a rega. It should only be a moment and not more than that. Even though a moment could be several years, right? But for a shame, it's a moment. It goes by. And when you look back at your life, you say, yeah, it, it went by so quickly, right? So that's the idea here, kirega be'apo. And the same thing with the galut. The diaspora is a very long diaspora. It's almost 2,000 years. But the Navi says, Rega katona zavtich, it's only a small moment, a fleeting moment. And Hashem says, I've left you just for a little moment, but soon I will be with you forever. So imagine 2,000 years for Hashem. It's Rega. So Kerega Bapo, so sometimes the anger is there, but it's only a Rega, and it could be undone. It could be canceled. Chaim Birtsono, Hashem. Is not being bribed. The rabbis tells us be careful not to say that Hashem can be bribed. Here we're talking about birtsono, to appease him the same way we would do with sacrifices. 
The sacrifice was not just the animal, it was the whole confession, it was the whole approach that, that we had in facing or dealing with our, our mistakes, if it was something done by mistake, or dealing with something that was unintentional, but then there wouldn't be a sacrifice usually. Sacrifices were for something that was done un, uh, unintentional. But either way, Teshuvah is accepted at all times, and t that could make the whole difference of whether a person uh, continues to suffer or not. Now, here he doesn't say it, but he says it elsewhere. It could be that a person is doing complete Teshuvah, and now he begins to suffer. Says, what do I do wrong now? And I, I'm doing Teshuvah. So why is this coming to haunt me now? Life, for some people who were secular, was very good until they did Teshuvah. And, and that's, an, that's another explanation. That happens because Hashem says, listen, I love you so much right now that I want to cleanse you. So now I'm sending you a package of pain and suffering for a number of years that will clean you up. So obviously without learning, without knowing these things, it becomes very, very difficult to understand. Why now? He's keeping Shabbat now. He didn't keep Shabbat all his life. Are things happening you know, the way they are? That's not anger. It has nothing to do with anger. It has to do with kapara. Anger is something completely different. Sometimes it's difficult to know what it is. It could be a person's mazal. You know, I told you people come and tell me, Rabbi, I have an, an, an ainara. Somebody gave me an evil eye. You know, they're suffering. They think it's an evil eye. It could be their mazal. Just a mazal, you know, mazal has ups and downs. It could be that there's an accusation from Shemaim on them. You know, it's, sometimes it's not easy to, to figure it out. That is why we try everything we can. But some people like to blame just an evil eye. It could be mo much more than that. It could be something more serious. So if he's about to shuvah, he knows that he's doing real proper to shuvah, more, more likely than not, it's a kapara. It's a kapara for the sins of the past, and it's a good kapara because Hashem loves him. Hashem wants to clean him, and he's better off being cleansed here. So if a person sees that there is a apo, that there is the anger of Hashem upon him, at, at the very least he should remember it could last for a very short time, and his approach would be chayim birtsono, to ask Hashem to forgive him, to give him back his life, and Bezat Hashem, if his prayers are answered, it will be that he, he will go to sleep at night with crying, perhaps, but in the morning he will get up with rejoicing. This is a very, very <laughs> interesting pasuk. David Amelech really is expressing what many people think. Even though he's saying, I said, he's really saying, a lot of people say this. When I had a good time, when everything was going well for me, I say, oh, this is for sure going to last forever. I will never fail, never collapse, never come down, never lose. Never falter. A lot of people think when things are going okay, it will just be like that. People are healthy the next day. They're either uh, sick or dead. You know, there's no guarantee if something is good now, it will be so a moment later. There was a person who has to be careful not to be confident that things will continue the way they are. I mean, we hope they do. So David Melech says, he, he too. What can go wrong now? Everything is fine. Until I realized, the, the next pasuk is a continuation. Until I realized, Adonai I see Hashem that it's you who decide, when you make the decision, it's you who decides, you are the one that, that when you decide, you give support, you raise, you support, to my mountain, Oz, you give strength. In other words, it's, it's a description of, of Hashem is the one that decides when the individual will be healthy, strong, in a good position, I realize that it's up to you. You can take that away, you can give that. So all, all along I thought if things are okay, they're gonna continue. No, and then I realized later on, it's birtsolcha. It's when you decide, it's up to you. Hey, if you give the individual strength to survive or not, 
Because oy vavoy, God forbid, if if he start up on echa, if you conceal your face, haiti nivhal, then I would be alarmed. I would be in shock. I would, you know, I would be fearful. In other words, because concealment of Hashem's face is another term that we've used quite a, quite often. Is a, is indicative that Hashem does not want any involvement, any ashgacha. It does, it does not, it does not come out and and perform miracles for us directly and openly. So it appears to us as though he abandoned us, even though he did not, but it gives that appearance. But whenever Hester Panim does happen, we're more exposed to the mazal, and to the elements, to the mikrim, things that happen by chance, and no longer to the Ashgacha of Hashem. So there's a big difference when Hashem is mashgiach, is involved, and leads us, guides us, advises us. It's so beautiful. You know, when a person is meritorious, he has clarity. How does he get clarity? I'll give you a quick example. He has some doubts about something. And he takes out the tehillim. He's about to say tehillim. He's there tehillim. But he opens it up instead of the beginning. He just opens it up like this in the middle. And the answer that he was looking for is on the top of the page. Now, obviously, a person has to be sensitive to that. He has to understand the text. But Hashem communicates with us. People sometimes want a sign. Hashem, give me a sign. Give me, show me. So obviously, depending on the individual, if he behaves himself or not, if he's good or not, Hashem will, will, through his ashgacha, guide him and show him what he needs to do. People are afraid. People don't know what to do. What are we going to do? I don't know. Should I marry her or not? Should I marry him or not? Give me a sign. <laughs> right? Some people need a sign. Some people don't are not convinced. Is this the job for me? Is this the, the wife? Is this the the right thing to do? They want a sign. And Hashem gives signs. You know, we don't always pick up on them. The more bitachon, the more trust we have in Hashem, the closer we are to Him, the more we pray to Him. It's simple. It's black and white. The Ashgacha is there all the time. Not everyone understands this, of course. Not everyone has it in the same level. There's different levels of Ashgacha. You know, some great rabbis say the Ashgacha is so strong with them that they not only are able to see things into the future and see things in the present, that their blessing comes true and their advice is 100% of correct advice. Obviously, Hashem uses them as a channel. The greater a person is, then of course, the chances are that whatever, everything he says is 100% true. In other words, Hashem will not, uh, will, not do, will not allow a mistake to come out of his mouth. If he advised you something, that's, his, that's what it's supposed to be. There are all kinds of situations. I mean, you know, a rabbi could say something and nothing happened because he tried. He blessed and he suggested. It doesn't mean that the results will always be positive, but it's not going to be the wrong advice. Unless, of course, the individual is not uh, deserving. Yes. You mentioned before, Rabbi, about uh, sometimes there's a situation where you can write the question or the answer on the on a note and put it on the pillow. Yes. Go to sleep, and the next morning it'll yeah. be on your lips, on your tongue. Yes. How advisable is that? That is also possible. That's called shelat chalom. That's asking for an answer in a dream. But that is a little bit more complicated. That requires purity. That requires uh, something uh, on the level of uh, kedusha, purity, you know, and proper kavanah. And it, has, it cannot be just done on any day. It cannot be just for any question. You have to know what you're doing. Some of the, some of the methods. To accomplish that require fasting even, and they all require certain certain prayers to be said. So not everyone can do that. Uh, but we, we have to remember what the Torah says, Tamim Hashem you don't really have to ask too much. Most of the time, it will happen. Whatever needs to happen will happen. It's just for people who are really in tremendous doubt. And some rabbis were, were really had doubts. They, just, they, you know, they just went through the Holocaust. Should we go to America or go to Israel? So they did something called Goral Hagra. The Goral, 
the lottery of the, the, the casting of the lot, not the lottery, the casting of the lot of the Gaon of Vilna, which is uh, something similar to that, but a different method in, that employs a Tanakh, where you get the answer from a certain basuk after, after uh, flipping a certain amount of pages. So this was, of course, was done by many rabbis in all kinds of situations that were really, really tough. But uh, we don't just use it for anything. But it is possible, because we're talking here a little bit about the various forms of Ashkecha that, that occurs. And uh, if one understands it, then he, he, there's no reason for him to fear. That is what prayer is for, to turn to Hashem and to ask him for guidance. So David HaMelech understands that everything is up to Hashem, and even though we do everything right and we think, okay, we, it should go on forever, it may not go on forever what we're doing. There are changes, uh, people become you know, older, they get older, and uh, there's all kinds of things that happen in life that are beyond our control. So Hashem birtsoncha, it's up to Hashem, you're the one that gives us the strength, you're the one that supports us, that holds us, so, therefore, chaz v'shalom, don't conceal your face, because if you conceal your face, chaz v'shalom, then I would be very, very concerned. I would be nivhal, I would be fearful, because the ashkacha is gone. Elech avlai ikra veladonai etchanan. I call out to you, and I beg you. To my master, to, to God, I beg. What does this mean? First of all, he's telling us that when anyone is in pain and going through suffering, don't forget to call out to him. I mean, we go to doctors, we go seek help, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we have to do our ishtadut, we have to do whatever we can according to the laws of nature to receive some sort of assistance, whether it's advice, financial assistance. But Elecha Hashem I noticed, I realized that in the end, I have to turn to you, because you are the right address. But when I turn to you, El Hashem et Hanan, I beg, I beg, I implore, I plead, however you want to translate it. What does that mean? Rabbis tell us that when we pray to Hashem, don't make the prayer a routine that you run through every day, you say the words, whether you understand it or not. Make those words tahanunim. Take the opportunity that you're standing right now before the king and beg, you know, and say the words seriously as though you're a poor man begging. When the prayer is a form of communication with Hashem of the, of the kind that it's, he's begging, he's pleading, it has much more effect than if he's just saying plain words. So the rabbis therefore encourage us to take the time and focus or concentrate more on the words to give them more of the flavor of begging, of turning to Hashem, realizing that we depend on Him. So don't just call out to Him by reading through the prayer book quickly, but at Hanan, implore or plead with Him that He should listen to you. And obviously, this may help. Otherwise, you wouldn't say it. When a person just reads the prayer book, it may not go anywhere. But if it's at Hanan, he pleads as though he really, really believes that this is his only chance to speak to the Almighty, he may get somewhere. When we talk about prayer, usually we mean we pray or others pray for us. There is a situation where the angels pray, where the angels ask for our behalf, on our behalf, too. And that's a very, there's an interesting story in the Gemara by Binyamin HaTzadik. Binyamin HaTzadik was a Gabay Tzedakah. He used, to, he used to support the poor. He collected money, he had the funds, and he distributed amongst the poor. One year, it was a year of famine drought, and there was less money in the kupa, you know, to distribute. There was less money, less funds. A woman came to him, a widow, 
And she said, please, Benjamin, support me. Give me some help. And he says, I swear to you that there's, I don't have anything. It's empty. I gave it all out already. And she told him, if you don't give me something, then a widow and her seven daughters will die of hunger. So he took out money from the little bit that he had in his own pocket for himself. And he gave them. Anyway, not too much, not long after this incident, he became very, very sick. And he was on his deathbed. So what is, what's going to happen now? The Malachim got involved. The Malachim went to Hashem and said, you said one who saves one life is as though he saved an entire world. This man saved a woman and her seven daughters. You know, you're going to let him die just like that? I mean, he deserves to live. If any, I mean, he did such a big mitzvah. And as a result of the malachim, the angels imploring Hashem or asking Hashem, they added 22 years to his life. And he recovered. Some people ask, why 22? What kind of a number is 22? So I explained that 15 years is a number, is an amount of years that we've seen in other situations where the, the Shemaim added, and there was Hashem added to the individual. So perhaps 15 years was added for the mother and one year per daughter. Maybe. That's 22. That's how I came up with 22. Anyway, regardless, we see that prayer or malachim, <laughs> who are aware of our deeds, who are aware of our prayers, who are aware of what we do, they too communicate before Hashem. And that can make the difference of whether a person remains alive or not. So Elech Hashem Ekrav El Adonai Etchanan, David HaMelech reminds us, the reason I turn to you, you are the address, because I also know that the pain and suffering is coming from above, it's not just coming randomly, arbitrarily. It's coming from you, and you are the address to turn to, to remove them. Ma betza bedami beretil shachat ayudecha afar hayagid amitecha. These are, these are very, very powerful words. David Amina says, what benefit will, will Hashem have if he dies? Beritil, Shachat, if I go down to the grave, Hayodecha, Afar, will the dust thank you or praise you? Hayagid Amitecha, will he talk about your truth? Will he say anything about you? you know, once a person dies, once he goes back to earth, from the grave, nothing comes out. So in other words, what benefit will you gain from having me go? The reason why this is powerful is because when somebody says that, if he really means it, you know what he's saying? Hashem, I have still so much to accomplish. I still have so much to do. My life is worth it. I can do so much for you. I remember hearing a story about Rabbi Ravaran Kotler when he was once visiting Yerushalayim and he attended a wedding. It was uh, during the time that they were, the Jordanians were shooting right across the other side of Jerusalem. In other words, there was a, Jerusalem was the divided city. So in the middle of the wedding, everybody had to, you know, uh, crouch. I guess that's the word in English. Go down. Huh? Go down, yeah. And there was someone, either the Chatan or someone else who was, who was uh, on the floor next to the rabbi, and he overheard the rabbi saying, Rebono Shalom, I still have so much to accomplish. You know, why take me now? In other words, you know, preserve my life. I still have a lot to do. And Baruch Hashem, of course, you know, the rabbi you know, went on to accomplish a great deal. He, the Holy Yeshiva of Lakewood is to his credit. A tremendous amount of the Torah in America is to his credit. So, What would you gain from me if somebody really means that this, this line itself could save his life? People who have had near-death experiences, they were upstairs, they, the ones in charge, I said, why do you want to go back? 
because I have kids who are still young. That's not a reason to go back. A lot of people leave behind kids. When he said, when this one particular individual says, I want to correct my mistakes, I want to publicize what I just saw, I want to talk about the importance of Teshuvah, I said, oh, for that you can go back. So these kinds of, of prayers or these kinds of requests can make a difference. So David Amela says, what will you gain Hashem if you, you know, allow me to die? From the dust, nothing will come out. But that's as long as he's serious that he wants to do something with himself with his time. Otherwise, if people don't use it time wisely, it's like in Pirkei Avot. It's brought down in various examples of individuals who are mitchayev ben nafshot. They're guilty uh, of, of the death penalty. In other words, they're, they might as well die if they're killing the time, the precious gift that Hashem gave them. There are certain things that if people do, certain activities which are completely waste of time and useless, it's like they might as well die. It was they're risking their life because Hashem is going to say, well, apparently he has no, no need for life. Let's fire him. Fire him because you know, life is like a job. He doesn't need to be around. So when people do certain things that are totally useless, they're awakening an accusation against them. This is exactly the opposite of that. By saying the words, Ma betza bedami, you know, what, what benefit will you gain if I die? It's obviously because he's sincere about how much he wants to accomplish, how he wants to use his time wisely. So as long as you're doing the right thing, this is a very, very powerful words to say to Hashem, you know, why leave this world before my time when I have so much to do? Towards the end of the Perek, he says, Shema Adonai Bechoneni, Adonai Heye Ozerli. So listen to me, listen to my prayers, and be compassionate to me, and be a helper to me. So here he's saying, accept my commitment and accept my prayers as though they are, you know, a promise doing something with my time. Even though he doesn't say those words that he's promising that he's committing himself, obviously that's what he meant when he's saying Shema Hashem V'choneni. What for? In other words, why would you want to be alive for? So when he says, listen to my prayer and have pity on me, it's because of everything else that he said all along, and he said a lot so far, right? That he still wants to accomplish, that he wants to build the Bet HaMikdash, that he wants to praise Hashem, that he wants to proclaim, and he wants to publicize everything. Uh, but David Amelch, of course, accomplished a lot, just with his tehillim. So when he says, Shema Hashem Bechoneni, he's, it's not just a prayer. Oh, keep me alive. F for what? Why do you want to stay alive for? Well, I want to use my time wisely in the service of Hashem. Shifti bevet Hashem. Remember that pasuk we said before? I want to sit in the house of God. I want to study. I want to pray. I want to teach. That is very noble. That may do it. Hafachta mispedi lemacholi pitachta sakiva tazereni simcha. This is a very beautiful pasuk. Kadosh Baruch you have transformed my mourning, M O U R N I N G, to mourn, misped, lemachol, to a dance. It was the exact opposite. From mourning, it became a dance. It became something to, to be happy with. You opened up my sack. This is a description also of being in mourning, in being in evil, in, in being in pain, and wearing something, you know, that goes along with that. You opened it up, you know, it was got rid of that, and instead you covered me up with or you girdled with me, you girdled me, if you want to translate literally, but te'azereni, with simcha, with happiness. What this is indicative of is situations like Purim, of which there were many in her history, where there was a potential for a misped, God forbid. It was going to be a terrible tragedy. It was going to be a terrible uh, day or days or months or years of mourning, chaz for something. And Hashem said, 
I'm going to transform that day to a joyous day, to a, to a day that you will celebrate forever, that you will not mourn. And that is the promise that we're told by the prophets who will be with Tisha Be'av in all the days of fasting. That Hashem yafochotam lemoadim tovim, leyamim tovim. Hashem will transform these days to holidays. Mm -hmm. So even though we fast and we're in pain and we mourn, we're supposed to remember that these will be afachta mispedi lemacholli. They will be converted, they will be transformed to days of joy and days of happiness. So this historically has happened a lot. This historically has happened to individuals, right? And it has happened to the communities uh, all over the world. There, there was not just one Purim, there was something, there was, there was even a Purim Hebron, the city of Hebron. The Jewish people, the Jewish community of Hebron celebrate their own Purim and their own day because of something similar that happened to them years ago. And today it's not uh, celebrated because that community is long gone. But there were this kind of situations where Afachta Mispedi Hashem converted or transformed the, what could have been a Misrat Chas Vashom and he became a Machol and Pitachta Sakiva Tazreni Simcha. David Amelech has seen it himself, the difficulties that he's had in the end. He was able to celebrate the, the joy of seeing better times. And this is what we're supposed to believe. It's not something that just happened in the past. That, oh, I'm sharing with you something that happened with me. We're supposed to believe that even though the times are difficult and we are going through war, but very, very soon it will be a time to celebrate, not a time to be uh, concerned or a time to be worried, a time to be in pain. The last pasuk, the reason why you've done all this for me is that I should continuously praise you and sing to you. Kavod here doesn't mean honor, it means my soul. It's another description of the soul. In order that my soul should sing to you, should praise you, yidom and should never be silent. Now that's interesting. Why add the words never be silent? Because David Melech is telling us that Hashem wants us to continuously, for the rest of our life, anyone who, had, who as, as an individual ever had a miracle happen to him, should continuously talk about it, not just once. That is what we do Pesach. What do we do Pesach? We celebrate what happened years ago, and we do it every year. And we tell our children and our grandchildren. One generation tells the next generation, don't forget. So. The, in order for us to continuously benefit from Hashem's Ashkacha and see more and more miracles, Hashem says, I will do it for you, but In other words, don't be quiet, don't stop. Don't say, okay, you know, things are okay. Now we don't have to thank Hashem, Chaz Shalom. You know, right now the war stopped. It's okay now. No, Continuous, continuously thank Hashem, pray to Hashem, Right? We've spoken about this idea before. Even though somebody's not sick, in the Amidah, he still says, Refainu Hashem and Rafe. Hashem, heal me. But you're not sick. It's better to pray when you're not sick than when you are sick. It was Hashem, please heal me. In other words, don't make me get sick. That's even better. So we continuously turn to Hashem, continuously pray to Hashem, praise Hashem, not only to remember that we are dependent on Him and that we need Him, that He's the source of all the blessing, but that all that he has done for us in the past is in order leman, in order that we should not stop. Therefore, Hashem, you're my God, I will always thank you. Rabbis tell us, why do we read the Megillah, Megillah Purim, at night and during the day? Why don't we just read it once? Because in the time of Purim, they cried and prayed day and night. They didn't stop. And so because of that, zechel for that, in remembrance of that, we read the Megillah twice, during the night and during the day. Very important idea is that people should continuously say Tehillim, not because Tehillim is powerful, besides that, it's a, it's a prayer. It's a form of prayer, it's a praise to Hashem. And if one does not understand it, that it's really, I mean, I don't want to say it has no value, it still has value, because it's still a powerful prayer, 
but it's, it's much more powerful when we understand the words and we realize that a lot of what he's saying and what he went through, we went through. It happened to us. All kinds of situations where people know either that they were very sick, that Hashem saved their life, or that they were in immediate danger, or that they were in a tremendous uh, down or low in their life, financially, emotionally, or in some other way. And something happened to them that got them out of it. And it's not that the, the individual himself got himself out of it. Never think like that. We're always supposed to give the credit to Hashem because he has, Rabbi said, he has many messengers to accomplish it. It could be somebody called you up. Do you know how many people thought of committing suicide in the last minute they got a phone call? And because of that phone call, at that moment, they somehow canceled their plan. I mean, all like this weird strange stories of all kinds of things that saved people, made them think differently. It could have been a friend, it could have been a neighbor, it could have been a doctor, it could have been a, it could have been a psychologist, it could have been a, uh, all kinds of things, you know, that uh, a friend, you know. Therefore, we're, we're not supposed to Shalom, ignore people. It could be that a kind word or something that we do for them, give them a sidur, show them to pray, it could be that it will help them go a long way. And it could be that Hashem is using us as a messenger too. So we don't know. We should not underestimate our koach. And we have to try, especially when we're dealing with another Jew, where we are arevin, we are responsible for them. A lot of people are going through all kinds of hardships. And some people have the ability, either financially or through their patience or through some other form, to help them. And they have to help. Otherwise, that individual is going to get the help from somewhere else because Hashem wants him to. But we will be missing out on the mitzvah. You know? And if we could have stopped something, could have stopped an argument or a fight and we didn't, then, then we get the blame for it too. Because if you don't protest and you don't do something about a situation, that means you, you're, you're, you're agreeing with it. You're going along with it. And that's not right either. So Hashem wants us to praise Him, not only in recognition of what He has done for us, but in order to convince others that this is real, that Hashem interacts with us, Hashem protects us, and Hashem will continue to protect us if we recognize that. The segula of this perek is a very interesting one. It was, segula means the special properties or qualities of this particular chapter to be said is for anything that is not going well in our life. So this is a very general perek for anything. And that is why it's in our prayer book, right? It's more Shir Chanukat Abayi David we say every morning. Right, this chapter. It's a powerful prayer for anything that is not going on. Right? No, there's various perakim that are good for all kinds of things. This one is more general. For anything that is not going right, we want it to be better. Then we turn to Hashem and we, of course, have to be optimistic. People sometimes, because of their lack of bitachon Hashem, because of their pessimism, they ruin it for themselves. They don't have enough trust, and they become very, very sad and miserable, and uh, they make things more difficult for themselves. So Tehillim and Torah in general, all Torah, it brings, it, it restores our mood, it, it elevates our mood, it, it brings, it, it instills happiness in us. In us. That is why we don't learn Torah during Tisha B'Av just the, the sad portion, because it makes one happy. You read stories about Sadiqim. You see, wow, what miracles. Look what they did and how they lived their lives. People need this kind of source of inspiration. Otherwise, they're, 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 they can have easily have a hard time. If a person is not exposed to Torah, and just exposed to the outside world, you go crazy. Look what, you know, in Japan they have a park. It's a suicide park. They go to the edge of the park, there's a cliff, and they throw themselves down the cliff. Because it's a stressed life. In Japan, it's very, very stressed. It's work, 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 work. And when you go into the subway, everybody's like a sardine. So it's crowded, expensive. Work, is that what life is all about? It, 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 people who do not have a shem in their life, who do not have to run their life, they're missing so much. They don't realize what the purpose of all of this is. That there's Mashiach coming, there's Tchiyat Metim. It's such a rich life for a Jew, if he observes it properly, that it, it's incredible. Day and night. 
It doesn't mean that people who are religious won't have difficulties. All I'm saying is that if they don't uh, recharge their batteries mm -hmm. by learning the Torah on a regular basis, they will be missing out a lot. I think Tehidim is so beautiful because David Amelech is not only sharing his experiences and, and telling us why we should believe in Hashem. He, in a sense, by expressing himself the way he does, he's telling him that this, look at what he did to him. Look how he was helped because he believed in Hashem so much. In other words, look what it did to him. Look how it transformed him. So uh, it, I think it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous cure, not that the words of the Tehillim are the cure, but it's a, it can bring a tremendous cure for a person who truly, really trusts in Hashem and turns to Hashem, whether it's in, in, an, in a situation that he is ill and the doctors have given up hope on him, or because it's very, very difficult, or because he's going through a difficult problem at home or with a child, regardless of the issues. David Amelech covers everything and reminds us that even the most difficult situation, afachta mispedile maholi, the most difficult situation, Hashem can transform it from being something very difficult, challenging, painful, to something that Bezat Hashem will bring all of us a lot of joy. Bezat Hashem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.